Welcome to part 3 of On the Trail of Charles II, where in this final episode we will be visiting Mosley Old Hall. Mosley Old Hall was built in 1600 under the instruction of Henry Pitt, a local merchant and a staunch Catholic. The original building was timber framed and set to a plan typical of the 17th century layout. Sadly, the house was encased in brick in the 1870s. Mosley was the turning point in Charles's time on the run. The two tense nights he spent hiding here gave the fugitive monarch and his allies enough time to form the basis of a plan, which would change many times before his final escape to France. Today, its open fires, oak panelled interior and those same hiding places create that same sense of refuge and a welcome that has been preserved for over 350 years. It was through this heavily studied door which Charles II entered in the early hours of the 8th of September 1651. The kitchen, with its red tiled floor, has had many uses over the years, from a kitchen to a makeshift brew house, as a huge fireplace and grain chute reveal. The original half has long since disappeared, but visitors today can stand in this space, smelling freshly baked bread using traditional methods and get a sense of the home run by Alice and Thomas Whitgreave in the mid-1600s. It was in this room that in the early hours on the 8th of September 1651 that the young Thomas Whitgreave ushered the Pendrill brothers who were escorting Charles II in for something to eat and drink before their long cold walk back to Boscobel House. This small room was a dressing room, which has a door which leads to a small wardrobe where you can see a hiding place. Hidden in the floor is a trapdoor, and beneath that the hiding place, capable of holding four people, and whose door is secured on the underside with a stout wooden bolt. Charles II declared this dark, cramped hiding place the best place he was ever in. This witty remark, at such perilous times, demonstrates the personality of the man who would later be known as the Merry Monarch. This room was where Charles spent most of his time at Mosley, close to Mosley's main hiding place and accessible via the back stairs. Here. Charles was able to rest, recover and formulate a plan for his escape. The room today contains the original four poster bed on which the young king lay in 1651, fully clothed to aid a hasty escape, although for many years the bed wasn't at Mosley at all. It ended up in the hands of a local politician and industrious Sir Geoffrey Mander who lived at nearby Whitewick Manor and took a keen interest in Mosley. In 1962, Sir Geoffrey's widow, Rosaline Mander, gave the bed to the National Trust and it was moved back to the original home. Thomas Whitgreave's comfortably decorated room with its polished oak floorboards and panelling gives us an insight into life and status of a 17th century merchant and his family. The door in the panelling opens onto a small room, Thomas's study, which sits over the main porch. With both inner and outer doors, this was a private space where Thomas would have written confidential papers and discussed private matters. It was from the study that Charles II watched in dismay 
as the stragglers from his defeated army made their way along the main route from Wolverhampton to Stafford on their long walk back to Scotland. With soldiers arriving barefoot, injured and half starved, Alice Whitgrave took pity on them, dressing their wounds and offering much needed food. The hall was a central place for the household to gather, the heart of family life. Its walls were once probably covered with oak panels as a statement of wealth and status. The furniture today is from the period. The dining table is around 400 years old, while the gloriously carved livery cupboard used for storing food between courses dates to the late 17th century. The parlour was perhaps the best room in the house an intimate space open only to the family and their most important guests. The parlour houses objects of the period, including a letter from Charles II. The letter is dated the 23rd of November 1652 and written in the King's own hand from the safety of Paris. Charles II writes to her as his most affectionate friend, Jane Lane. In it, he tells her that he hopes to live long enough to repay the enormous debt he owes her. Some of the portraits in this room are of the characters who played a part in the next stage of Charles's story after he left Moseley. Father Huddleston, Jane Lane, Colonel John Lane and the King himself. They are a visual reminder of the tight-knit community of royalist families who put their own lives at risk in order to aid the king's escape. There is a happy ending to this tale. Almost nine years after fleeing England, Charles II returned and was reinstated as king. He did not forget those that helped him. Thomas Whitgreave, Charles Gifford, the Pendrills, Father Huddleston, Jane Lane and Colonel Lane were all granted pensions. The gardens at Moseley are perhaps best described as an illusion. With its not garden and period appropriate plants, everything from heritage apples to cottage garden flowers, it appears to be every inch Thomas Whitgreave's work. Yet nothing here is original. The garden is a historic recreation, one of the first of its kind, undertaken by the National Trust in the early 1960s. The showpiece of Moseley Old Hall is the Knot Garden. There are no surviving Elizabethan Knot Gardens as they fell out of fashion during the reign of Charles II, but original plans for them remain. The design of Moseley's is based on one of five laid out by Reverend Walter Stonehouse, rector of Darfield in Yorkshire, in 1631. Moseley Old Hall may seem a quiet country house with little significance, yet it played an important role in British history, and for that alone it is worth visiting. <laughs>